How did you remember that? Okay, we're going to finish up Truma today and uh, hopefully continue with the Tzave tomorrow. So we're on page 154. <coughs> so we talked about Shiflus and Vittel. We explained what those are. And the Rebbe says these are the basis of all avoda, all service of God. And I sort of went out on a, on a tangent that this is the universal things that need to be taught in schools. Um, by schools, you mean non-religious schools? Every school, every, every school on the planet, because th this is what makes a human being. How can you not be a human being, first of all? If you're going to say that you're learning that, no? Not really. Not, not, definitely not enough. Okay, Yud Beis. So now we're starting the second part of the Sikha. Right? Because you saw that at the, at the end of the first part, there's a, it tells you where they took the Sikhas from. Right? So now we have a, a, a new part of the Sikha, which is from Yud Shvat of Tavshin Yud Tet. And here, the, the second part is, is what we call the Havdala, the separation. Separation is all about identity, about who you are, both as a separate individual. Literally, it meant by the Baal Shem Tov that you're separating the... the uh, the negative side of your personality from the good side. But it's not just that, because you need to focus only on the good and, and completely ignore the negative. So, in the Pasuk Vasita, the Krashin, the Mishkan, the Shittim, the Mdim, the Zbir, the Vod, the Shat, the Mori, the Chami, the Mor, the Shittim, the Minishon, the Taya. So, the, we, we talked about the, uh, about the bases. Now we're talking about the planks themselves. So the planks were made out of hataya. Hataya, so it's means they translated as acacia wood. I have no idea what an acacia tree is, but maybe you do. I know what a shita is. So shita is like one of the main trees of Eretz Yisrael. There's ten different uh, species of shita in Eretz Yisrael. And the and the Vridigal Rebbe explained that shita, the name of this tree, acacia, comes in Hebrew from the word hataya. Taya means to have some kind of leaning. You lean in a certain direction because it's a. It's, it's like, I, I think a lot, a lot of times it, it, people will say it looks like a weeping willow. It doesn't have the same uh, leaves as a weeping willow, but it has the same general structure that it sort of hangs over itself. So that's what these shitot look, look like. So he says in, in the nefesh, it also means. A leaning in certain in a certain direction. So right away you see the the connection here to separation to um, every person being a little bit different. We have different leanings. Now says the Rabbi. So it says what the Rambam talks about that a person should follow the mean path, right? the, the the average path, as it were, not to much to this extreme and not too much to that extreme. It should be in the middle. So that is called the way of the mind and contemplation. And when you lean from the middle path, then, it's, that, then we call it that you have a leaning. You have not just a leaning, here it says shtut. You have a narishkeit. You have some kind of... Um, you're a fool. It's, it's foolish. Because why would you lean from the middle path? The middle path is the best. There are two types of leaning from the middle. One is, There's, when you lean below what the rational mind says. And that's called the foolishness that comes from the other side. And so you just say that a person does not do an Avera unless a spirit of foolery, of foolishness, comes to overtakes him. But there's another type. That he goes above what the rational mind says. Not under, not lower than the rational mind. And that's called Shtus de Kedusha. That's what the Alter Rebbe talked about, the Alter Rebbe, the Fridigur Rebbe talked about in Basi Lagani, right? From chapter 3 and on, he talks about this idea of Shtus de Kedusha. 
In fact, what was this idea? The idea was that in the time of the Rashab, the Rashab was the one who started talking about Shtut of the Klipa. He started saying that the, that the name of the Yetzirah in his time, in the late 1900s, early, uh, sorry, late 1800s, early 1900s, was this Shtus. People started doing crazy. Stu- stupid things. Not crazy necessarily, not crazy, but foolish, like things that have no tachlis. They have no goal, they have no purpose. They just do it because it, that was like the Gilded Age. Remember that? It was a. Uh, when? Right. So, the Gilded Age, at least in America, was a time that people had enough money already. They were very wealthy people. And uh, they weren't just, you know, a few families that were wealthy. There was a whole, whole part of society. And they were very. They, they, they just they were engaged in nonsense, like nothing of value. So he, sta- he started saying that that was the Yetzirah in our generation. So, so the Friedrich Rebbe came, came with, with a very interesting answer. He said he can't fight it in this case. There's something in the world that Hashem wants the Shtus to be used now. So instead of Shtus of Tuma, the lower, going lower than the rational mind, you have to go to the Shtus that's higher. Meaning you have to teach a person that to do, if you're going to do foolish things, do foolish things in Kedusha. And in a certain sense, that's how the Rebbe came up with the Miftaim. A lot of the Miftaim, and even building the type of the Lubavitcher that the Rebbe built, is sort of like going against the grain of normalcy. Like who goes out and, and, and starts a shul when he doesn't have a salary and he doesn't have, what is this? It's like you're being irresponsible. So that irresponsibility, that is a shtus of kedusha. Kedugmat mamar azal ahane leshtut lesava. That the shtus helped the older man. Avodat hamishkan vamigdash ila fuch ta shtut deleumadze ila sota leshtut de kedusha kamuzbar sham berchava. And as he explains in 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 Bati Lagani, the taking the shtus of Shtus, of just empty foolishness, and transforming it into a shtus of Kedusha, that is what the Mishkan does. That's what it means to be serving Hashem in our generation. What's, what's the Yitzhah Haru today? It's not, it's not the problem. It's the means. What are people looking for today that drives them crazy? That, that really takes them off of... Uh, that, that they can't dedicate their lives to anything of value. They're looking for publicity, to be famous. Oh, yeah? yeah, because it's very easy today. Uh, relatively easy. All you need is half a million subscribers on YouTube, and you're, you're famous. So, what do you need to do? You need to build people who are willing to do that, but with Kedusha. They're willing to dedicate their lives to going on YouTube and even saying ridiculous things, but explaining Torah that way, like in a certain way. So the people, everybody, everybody wants to be known today. Everybody wants to be famous. Because you're from the old generation. You're, you're from the... Baby boomers. Right? You were born after, after the war. Right? You weren't born before the war. So you're a boomer. So boomers, they don't know anything about being famous. The, the boomers that wanted to be famous became politicians. Or they became like, I don't know, like Elton John. They became singers. You don't have to do a, a song and a dance today to become famous on, on YouTube. You can, you can saw something. You do it with enough finesse. <laughs> People will sus- subscribe to your channel. That's how it works. So, so but, but the Mishkan is meant to take the foolishness of Tuma and turn it into foolishness of, of, of Kedusha. So that's what the, the Mishkan, how, how do you say that? So, so he says, if it's like that, So he says, today you can't just hold by the middle path. This is the Rebbe saying this. You can't, don't, the Rebbe was, you know, many times people ask the Rebbe about um, 
how should I learn? Should I begin? Like, the Rebbe many times said, it's over. There's always exceptions to the, to the, to the case, but in general, this thing of the way that they used to learn in the first half of the, 19th, of the 20th century, and before then, which was that you started learning at the beginning of brachos, and six, seven years later, you, you, you closed Evan Ezer, you finished the Shulchan Aruch and Evan Ezer. It doesn't exist anymore. It's not that you can't do it. It can be done. It's not, it's not the most difficult thing in the world. But people don't do that anymore. Everything is shtus. Like you can't find, you can't find somebody, or again, they're very, very rare people. And even the Rebbe didn't really recommend this for people. There were only a few individuals that he told them to stick, stick it out and keep learning that way. But most people, the Rebbe said, Chatof v'achol. You should grab what you can and take that and go out into, into shlichus or whatever, whatever else you're going to be doing. But you can't, you don't have the presence of mind anymore. So, if you don't have the apiseicho, if you don't have the regular mindset, the rational mindset, to learn all of Torah, be Seder, and be a Talmud Chacham. So, so what do you have to do? So, you have to have something that's above the, above the rational mind, that's higher. You can't be in a state where you're pursuing just the middle path. Because the middle path today is a, is a, is a path to destruction. It won't work. It won't lead you where you think you, 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 want, you, you want to go. It says, it's not enough. You can continue doing this if you have time. Continue learning. Maybe after 20 years you'll, you'll finish Evan Ezer. You, you will have learned all of Torah. I don't know how much you'll remember, but you will have learned it all. That's why the Rebbe always looked for short, shortcuts. The whole Rambam thing was a shortcut. Why was it a shortcut? Because with, by learning the Rambam, your are the mitzvah of Talmud Torah which is very, very hard to complete any other way. But if you learn the Rambam, al pi Seder, that's the reason that people learn it, learn it every year. Okay. So they're Yod Tzayim. They already know all, they, they've seen all the Halakha Psuka. It has a small problem. It's not B'te'ameh. It's not B'te It doesn't explain the reasoning behind the Halakha. And that the, the, the Shulchan Aruch of, of the Altar Rebbe does. But the Shulchan Aruch of the Alter Rebbe is not about all the topics. And the Rambam is about every single halachic topic on the face of the earth. You don't know what else face of the, the sky. Alter Rebbe got burned anyway. Okay, so we don't have it. So the Rebbe was looking for a shortcut. So the people could do that, you know, in a simple way, 45 minutes every day, and they'd be yod to the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. But he didn't tell people, look, you have to sit in the yeshiva now for 20 years, and don't don't be connected to the world. That, that was it's pretty nice to say that. What? It's a shame that nobody said that. What? That you should sit in a yeshiva for twenty years? Yeah. Well, where would you be today? I think be much happier. You're saying that as somebody who's already built himself. Chaim Zev all of a sudden told me not to leave the yeshiva, not to go back. Who's Chaim Zev? He was the again the Rabbi Big, 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 one of the Rambam Bosnikis. What? An American as well. What? An American as well. In any case, I think you did the right thing. Why is that? Because you wouldn't have you, you wouldn't have affected so many lives. You would have affected one life, maybe. Yes. Yeah, that's not that's not how you should think today. In any case. If the world wouldn't be so foolish, we wouldn't have the, the foolishness of the, what's lower than the rational, the shtus of the then maybe, not, not maybe, he says, the, the middle path would have been enough. But now that there's this blemish in the world, and because of the sin of the, again, it's what he's saying, he's saying that the Yetzer Har, what happened by the sin of eating from the tree of knowledge? 
that the Yetzirah became part of them. It was no longer something external. It became part of them. It's part, part of the world. You can't, you can't separate anything. So he says the only way you can separate the shtus de, de tuma out, the only way to get the foolishness that is improper out of, out of your system is by strengthening the foolishness for holiness. <clears throat> and this is exactly how separation works. Separation doesn't work by trying to trample the negative. You, can, you can't, or trying to segregate the negative out. You can't. The only way you can do it is by strengthening your identity with the positive side. And we talked about this when we talked about fear of God, for instance. A person has many, many different fears, phobias. The only way to get rid of them, really, to separate them out, is by strengthening the proper form of fear which is fear of Hashem, fear, fear of God. And when you dedicate yourself, you focus yourself on fear of God, it, it sort of, it, it, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, it, it um, sucks into itself through a sieve all the negative fears. And then the fear of Hashem becomes the main fear. And that, that, that's, how, that's how you rectify all these things. It's, it's, it's not submission here, it's separation. And separation really is to separate out, you have to strengthen the identity of the positive. So he says, the same thing is by everyone. If you've sinned, or you've blemished, or you've avarat aderich, is like you, you've completely neglected the path. Okay. Or even if you've just done one of them. The only way to progress is not by trying to follow the mean path. It won't work anymore. You have to go, you have to jump above the, the, the mean path. You have to go to something that's that's, people would call it foolish. This is the Rambam says the same thing in Shmona Prakim, in his introduction to Pirkei Avos. There he says also that the middle path, the mean path, is only for someone who's regular, who's normal. But if you've already lost your way, if you're already off the derech, so then you can't follow the mean path. You have to take a different extreme. Okay. So that was the book of the... What? And different things. The Rambam said this in, for instance, when it came to health. He said, in general, I want you to follow the mean path. But if you've been eating something very, very bad for you for a long time, you can't follow the mean path right now. You have to go to the other extreme. Of course, he says, to get to the other extreme, you have to get there slowly. You can't do it in one day. Yudal. Now, now we're finishing with the sweetening. The Fiyayamu, following what we've just said, Yuvana Devar, Shagmar Metzayen, Tatamala, Eliyuna, Beyotar, Vamusad, Ufaratzta. Lo ka Avraham, lo ka Yitzchak, ala ka Yaakov, shekatu bo, so now, since we now understand this thing of going beyond, using, again, here the, the point, the separation was that we're going to have good foolery to fix the negative foolery. Now he's going to say that now that we've seen that there's something above the mind, can I, um, Feeling like we missed something. Yeah. When we talked about Asita Takrashim, I think we started with the bases, then we have the planks, then we have the covering of the of the tabernacle. So in the in the in the separation he talked about the planks. We didn't he mentioned this earlier. He said that the planks they represent 
the uh, individual work that every person has to do. So that's all. That's a, again, that's separation. That's identity. Who am I? Who? Okay. So he says, in the things that are your individual task in the world, your mission in, in the world, you can't do them b'derucha mitzua. You can't really follow a mean path and say, I can be happy with doing something that's average. Whatever is your shlichus in the world, you have to do like you're a fool. Like you're willing to do things that are, people will say are irrational. Why, why would you do this? Now he's coming to something else. He's saying, since we learned this also, that there's this thing called foolery, and that's above the mind. So now let's take this thing of above the mind and expand it a little bit more. So now we're going to be talking about the covering that covers the planks, that covers the entire tabernacle. So he says, which, were basically open. which was actually like a not real, not a real roof. There's no, okay, it's, it's sort of you're, you're like saying, well, maybe in the desert it's not such a big deal, but it was a very strange thing, I think, that somebody would put the, you know, the temple of their God without a roof. Because they did this also in Eretz Yisrael, when, when they went in Eretz Yisrael, so in Shiloh and in Nov, they had a building, an actual building, made out of stone, and they used the coverings from the tabernacle, and that was the roof. And you know, it rains in Shiloh. It's not like, and so does it rain in Nov and Givon. It rains a lot. So what kind of, you know, what kind of covering is this? Why don't you build a proper roof over this thing? So he calls this uparatsta, that the roof is parutz, that the roof is, it's actually open. It's not really closed. So he says that the greatest level is reached not by Avram and not by Yitzchak, but by Yaakov. Why? Because by Yaakov it says, you should, you should spread out. You should burst out without any limits. Again, this is the foolery that's non-limited. It's, it's above the mind. Why is being able to burst forth greater than what Avram and Yitzchak had? There's something more that we have to explain about Paratzta, about not having a roof, let's call it. Again, the roof would be rational thought. Not having a roof would be going above the rational thought. Paratzta doesn't just mean that I'm spreading out. It also means that I'm getting rid of any barriers. The roof, not having a roof, is getting rid of the barrier. Because the roof is a barrier to you. Why is it a barrier? Because a person says, this is, as high, this is as high up as I need to go. I don't need to go up any higher. The moment that you can break there's no room for breaking through because it's an open field. Yeah. But when, and you get rid of one of the walls, or, or the roof in this case, that is called Ufaratzta. Yeah. What are we talking about? We're not talking about breaking through barriers that are negative barriers. And saying we're talking about positive barriers. What, is bar- what are the positive barriers that a person says, uh, he's going to bring this in a moment, like for instance, um, uh, giving tzedakah. Actually, he says it later, we won't get to it, so I'll say it now. He says the Baal Shem Tov didn't give a tw- uh, 20%. He gave much more than 20%. Why? Because that was breaking through the barrier that Halacha says you only need to give up to 20%. But it's not Stam Shtosik, he had joy in it. He says because he had joy in it, it's not really usher for him. Can, what does it say about it? It says, Simcha Puretzet Gadel. That if you really want to break down barriers, even if Kedusha, you have to do it with joy. Okay? It's like now another. Sheken, im ze binyan de leumat ze, in olam etosh advar binyan, ki minyan shechurban ufirutza. Because you can't really say that you're breaking down the barrier of something that's forbidden. Because if it's forbidden, it's not a barrier even. It's not a real building. It's not something that you should take any account of. You don't need to break through it. Because 
Like for instance, they say that the Rome, sometimes they call it uh, Tyre in, in the Lebanon, um, became a famous city after Jerusalem was destroyed. Meaning that when we do bad things, they, they go up. Okay? It's like the, the blessing that Yaakov gave to Esau, that Yitzchak gave to Esau. So if you break the barrier of something negative, it's not called breaking the barrier. It's actually fixing something. It's actually making sure that it, okay, you're fixing the good. So if the Torah calls something faratsa, breaking down a barrier, it's a real barrier. What's a real barrier? A real barrier is a barrier of holiness, a barrier that's according to the rational mind. So why do you call this building if you're breaking down a barrier? Because like we said, if, even if it's a building of holiness, and Torah calls it holiness, you need shtus of, of Kedusha. You need the foolery of holiness to break that down, to go beyond that. You have to go beyond that. Says, so what is this? So a few things. So now after this he gives two and a half pages of examples. Many, many, many examples. What does it mean to go beyond the letter of the law? What does it mean to go beyond? So, so the main thing he says is to add in learning Torah. And in, in, uh, even uh, in, in davening, and uh, in, even if you don't have time to daven, you still meditate for one minute, thirty seconds, and, and one pasuk that you say, anything like that. That's already tearing down a barrier. But the main point is that, like with the temple, with the tabernacle, sorry, the feeling has to be that I can't complete everything, and they need to have that Hashem will complete things for me. That's sweetening. Sweeting is feeling that it's not all in my hands. I have to go beyond in order to come to the place where it's Hashem who's doing things. And I can't do everything by myself. I have to always leave something open. That that's where you feel that Hashem is affecting you. We actually learned this when we learned um, uh, Parshas Bo. If you remember, we had there the opening of the hay. Uh, did, you, did we learn it? No, we have learned it. We have learned it. So the little opening of the hay, he says that's the opening to get out of the Yetzirah there, but sometimes to get inside, it's true. And that is where you feel the divine force pushing you and helping you. And when you feel that opening, then you can go beyond. You can't really go beyond until you're willing to feel that Hashem is beyond everything that, you, that you're able to and capable of doing. Okay. So we'll end here and tomorrow we'll start Truma. Uh, it's a seven. Very good.